This is a Lieber This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Swiss Family Robinson by Johann David Wyss. Chapter Seventeen. I rose early and descended the ladder a little uneasy about my kangaroo, and found I was but just in time to save it, for my dogs had so enjoyed their repast on the entrails, which I had given them the night before, that they wished to appropriate the rest. They had succeeded in tearing off the head which was in their reach, and were devouring it in a sort of growling partnership. As we had no storeroom for our provision, I decided to administer a little correction as a warning to these gluttons. I gave them some smart strokes with a cane, and they fled howling to the stable under the roots. Their cries roused my wife, who came down, and though she could not but allow the chastisement to be just and prudent, she was so moved by compassion that she consoled the poor sufferers with some remains of last night's supper. I now carefully stripped the kangaroo of his elegant skin, and washing myself, and changing my dress after this unpleasant operation, I joined my family at breakfast. I then announced my plan of visiting the vessel, and ordered Fritz to begin preparations. My wife resigned herself mournfully to the necessity. When we were ready to depart, Ernest and Jack were not to be found. Their mother suspected they had gone to get potatoes. This calmed my apprehension, but I charged her to reprimand them for going without leave. We set out towards Tent House, leaving Flora to protect the household, and taking our guns as usual. We had scarcely left the wood and were approaching Jackal River, when we heard piercing cries, and suddenly Ernest and Jack leaped from a thicket, delighted, as Jack said, in having succeeded in their plan of accompanying us and, moreover, in making us believe we were beset with savages. They were, however, disappointed. I gave them a severe reproof for their disobedience, and sent them home with a message to their mother that I thought we might be detained all night, and begged she would not be uneasy. They listened to me in great confusion, and were much mortified at their dismissal, but I begged Fritz to give Ernest his silver watch, that they might know how the time passed and I knew that I could replace it, as there was a case of watches in the ship. This reconciled them a little to their lot, and they left us. We went forward to our boat, embarked, and, aided by the current, soon reached the vessel. My first care was to construct some more convenient transport vessel than our boat. Fritz proposed a raft, similar to those used by savage nations, supported on skins filled with air. These we had not, but we found a number of water hogsheads, which we emptied and closed again, and threw a dozen of them into the sea, between the ship and our boat. Some long planks were laid on these, and secured with ropes. We added a raised edge of planks to secure our cargo, and thus had a solid raft, capable of conveying any burden. This work occupied us the whole day scarcely interrupted by eating a little cold meat from our game-bags. Exhausted by fatigue, we were glad to take a good night's rest in the captain's cabin on an elastic mattress, of which our hammocks had made us forget the comfort. Early next morning we began to load our raft. We began by entirely stripping our own cabin and that of the captain. We carried away even the doors and windows. The chests of the carpenter and the gunner followed. There were cases of rich jewelry, and caskets of money, which at first tempted us, but were speedily relinquished for objects of real utility. I preferred a case of young plants of European fruits, carefully packed in moss for transportation. I saw with delight among these precious plants apple, pear, plum, orange, apricot, peach, almond, and chestnut trees, and some young shoots of vines. How I longed to plant these familiar trees of home in a foreign soil! We secured some bars of iron and pigs of lead, grindstones, 
cartwheels ready for mounting, tongs, shovels, ploughshares, packets of copper and iron wire, sacks of maize, peas, oats, and vetches, and even a small hand-mill. The vessel had been, in fact, laden with everything likely to be useful in a new colony. We found a sawmill in pieces, but marked, so that it could be easily put together. It was difficult to select, but we took as much as was safe on the raft, adding a large fishing net and the ship's compass. Fritz begged to take the harpoons, which he hung by the ropes over the bow of the boat, and I indulged his fancy. We were now loaded as far as prudence would allow us. So, attaching our raft firmly to the boat, we hoisted our sail, and made slowly to the shore. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 The wind was favourable, but we advanced slowly, the floating mass that we had to tug retarding us. Fritz had been some time regarding a large object in the water. He called me to steer a little towards it, that he might see what it was. I went to the rudder and made the movement. Immediately I heard the whistling of the cord, and felt a shock, then a second, which was followed by a rapid motion of the boat. "'We're going to founder!' cried I. "'What's the matter?' "'I've caught it!' shouted Fritz. "'I've harpooned it in the neck. It is a turtle!' I saw the harpoon shining at a distance, and the turtle was rapidly drawing us along by the line. I lowered the sail, and rushed forward to cut the line, but Fritz besought me not to do it. He assured me there was no danger, and that he himself would release us, if necessary. I reluctantly consented, and saw a whole convoy drawn by an animal whose agony increased its strength. As we drew near the shore, I endeavoured to steer so that we might not strike and be capsized. I saw after a few minutes that our conductor again wanted to make out to sea, I therefore hoisted the sail, and the wind being in our favour, he found resistance vain, and, tugging as before, followed up the current, only taking more to the left, towards Falcon's Nest, and landing us in a shallow, rested on the shore. I leaped out of the boat, and with a hatchet soon put our powerful conductor out of his misery. Fritz uttered a shout of joy and fired off his gun, as a signal of our arrival. All came running to greet us, and great was their surprise, not only at the value of our cargo, but at the strange mode by which it had been brought into harbour. My first care was to send them for the sledge to remove some of our load without delay, and as the ebbing tide was leaving our vessels almost dry on the sand, I profited by the opportunity to secure them. By the aid of the jack screw and levers, we raised and brought to the shore two large pieces of lead from the raft. These served for anchors, and, connected to the boat and raft by strong cables, fixed them safely. As soon as the sledge arrived, we placed the turtle with some difficulty on it, as it weighed at least three hundred weight. We added some lighter articles, the mattresses, some small chests, etc., and proceeded with our first load to Falcon's Nest in great spirits. As we walked on, Fritz told them of the wondrous cases of jewellery we had abandoned for things of use. Jack wished Fritz had brought him a gold snuff-box to hold curious seeds, and Francis wished for some of the money to buy gingerbread at the fair. Everybody laughed at the little simpleton, who could not help laughing himself when he remembered his distance from fairs. Arrived at home, our first care was to turn the turtle on his back, to get the excellent meat out of the shell. With my hatchet I separated the cartilages that unite the shells. The upper shell is convex, the lower one nearly flat. We had some of the turtle prepared for dinner, though my wife felt great repugnance in touching the green fat, notwithstanding my assurance of it being the chief delicacy to an epicure. We salted the remainder of the flesh, and gave the offal to the dogs. The boys were all clamorous to possess the shell, but I said it belonged to Fritz, by right of conquest, and he must dispose of it as he thought best. Then, said he, I will make a basin of it and place it near the river, that my mother may always keep it full of fresh water. 
"'Very good,' said I. "'And we will fill our basin, as soon as we find some clay to make a solid foundation.' "'I found some this morning,' said Jack. "'A whole bed of clay, and I brought these balls home to show you.' "'And I have made a discovery, too,' said Ernest. "'Look at these roots, like radishes. I have not eaten any, but the sow enjoys them very much.' "'A most valuable discovery, indeed,' said I. "'If I am not mistaken, this is the root of the manioc, which, with the potatoes, will ensure us from famine. Of this root they make in the West Indies a sort of bread, called cassava bread. In its natural state it contains a violent poison, but by a process of heating it it becomes wholesome. The nutritious tapioca is a preparation from this root.' By this time we had unloaded, and proceeded to the shore to bring a second load before night came on. We brought up two chests of our own clothes and property, some chests of tools, the cartwheels, and the hand-mill, likely now to be of use for the cassava. After unloading we sat down to an excellent supper of turtle, with potatoes instead of bread. After supper my wife said, smiling, After such a hard day! I think I can give you something to restore you." She then brought a bottle and glasses, and filled us each a glass of clear, amber-coloured wine. I found it excellent Malaga. She had been down to the shore the previous day, and there found a small cask thrown up by the waves. This, with the assistance of her sons, she had rolled up to the foot of our tree, and there covered it with leaves to keep it cool till our arrival. We were so invigorated by this cordial, that we set briskly to work to hoist up our mattresses to our dormitory, which we accomplished by the aid of ropes and pulleys. My wife received and arranged them, and after our usual evening devotions, we gladly lay down on them to enjoy a night of sweet repose. End of chapter.